Welcome to Lunch with the League. My name is Rachel Terry, and I am the Deputy Director here at the Utah League of Cities and Towns. Uh, Lunch with the League is a webinar series we do twice a month on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. Uh, today, we have the opportunity to hear from the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget and from the Auditor's Office. We're very excited to hear what they have to say about the Infrastructure Bill and ARPA. Uh, our next Lunch with the League will be on September 6th. We will be talking about a new program called Your Land, Your Plan, which is an educational and support opportunity to learn about how to better utilize public assets in your communities. And we're really excited about this new program that will be uh, available to us through grants from Intermountain Healthcare and with support from Zions Bank. Uh, again, we are very excited to have our presenters here today. And I want to make sure they have all the time that they need to share the important information that they've brought to us today. Uh, their presentation will be recorded, and so you can share it. You can access it on our website uh, after today if there's anyone you think will benefit from the presentation today. Uh, we welcome anyone who's joining from the counties. This was opened up to not only league members, but also to our, U, our UAC friends. So welcome to them. Uh, jumping right in, I will turn it over to Sophia DeCaro, the Executive Director of GOPB. Great. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, I just want to start by saying how much we appreciate uh, what the Utah League of Cities and Towns does, as well as uh, the Utah Association of Counties. Appreciate the partnership um, we've had with Cameron Deal and, and, and Brandy Grace and um, all of the teams there. And uh, this is just an example of, of um, some of the things that we uh, collaborate with and, and what we can do to make things better. Um, we, we really wanted to be able to um, provide a, a resource to uh, all of the memberships with UAC and ULCT um, to make sure that you have the tools, resources, and um, whatever it is you need support uh, that you need to be able to execute some of the federal funds that we're seeing and have seen. And uh, really, we our goal is to avoid a gotcha type of scenario, but rather to help you navigate through those effectively so you can, um, you know, maximize the use of those things and, and do it in a way that keeps you compliant and uh, out of trouble. So um, we're really excited to partner up with uh, the auditor's office. Uh, you have a great team from the auditor's office here who is also going to be sharing some um, best practices. But uh, we'll give you an overview of what's uh, what, what's coming down the pike on the, the IIJA money, the infrastructure money, and then uh, share some best practices from our uh, perspective. Our, our office was uh, tasked with distributing a lot of the funds, and um, there's some nuances uh, associated with that as well. And we also get audited uh, by the auditor's office. And so we have a vested interest to make sure you have the tools that you need um, to keep you compliant so that we can also uh, be compliant ourselves. And so with that, I'll just turn the time over to our team. I, uh, we have Laura Hansen, who's the Managing Director of Planning Coordination, as well as Taylor Kaufman, who is a Senior Budget and Policy Analyst in our office. Office. He also is the federal assistance management officer and um, sad to say he's leaving our office to uh, go to the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, but he's been a great asset and I know he'll um, continue to work with these federal funds in his uh, new role. And so we're excited to uh, keep our partnership with him as well. But with that, I'll turn the time over to you, Laura. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Sophia um, and Taylor for getting the slides going. If you could just go right to the next one, that'd be great. Uh, and one after that. So uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is uh, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. This was passed last uh, fall by Congress. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, signed last November. And it is a $1.2 trillion funding package that's really meant to address a bunch of various different infrastructure needs across the country uh, in a number of key categories, transportation, energy, water, broadband, public lands, environmental remediation, and resiliency. And 
What's different about this federal funding as opposed to ARPA and some of the other uh, COVID relief funding packages that, that we received recently, like CARES, uh, those, those funding uh, packages were, were had a lot of discretion built into them. Basically, they just gave the state some money and said, here, state, you figure out where you, you need to spend this. The IIJA is quite a bit different where there are very specific funding programs, grant programs that have their own parameters and their own uh, uh, ways of, of, you know, limitations of what you can spend that money on. And so it's really going back to sort of the more traditional approach of, of receiving federal funds here in the state. And so that's a big distinction between this funding and the funding that we received previously. You could go to the next slide, Taylor. <clears throat> so I mentioned it's $1.2 trillion in total. $650 billion of that is simply reauthorization of existing federal spending. And so these are existing funding programs that states have been used to uh, receiving in the past, uh, but they have just increased the amount of funding that's available within some of these. There are about 12 different federal agencies that are administering these programs, and we counted something like 384 unique funding programs that are available within the law. There is some additional new funding uh, available as well in some new programs. Next slide. So within Utah, uh, we think of those 380 programs, about 319 are potentially eligible to, uh, to Utah stakeholders. Some of the ones that we're not eligible for are very specific to a geographic re region. So it's for um, you know, the Appalachian area or for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, we know that we have $4.1 billion that will be coming to Utah. That number is going to increase over time. We're still waiting for uh, additional state allocation numbers, uh, but we do know we'll be receiving that. Of that, the majority of it is reauthorization of existing formula funding, so money we were used to receiving anyways. There is an increase of an additional $633 million of new formula funding that is coming to the state. And uh, there's a number of grants um, and contracts that are competitive grants that we can go after as well. Next slide. So GOPB has been tasked with essentially sort of being the quarterback of, of the state's approach to this generational infrastructure funding opportunity. So within GOPB, uh, Sophia, Taylor, myself and a, a gentleman named Duncan Evans are kind of our core coordination team with here within GOPB. And then we have created a structure around that within state government to help us facilitate uh, the our approach to receiving these funds or going after these funds. We'll have a coordination team with individuals identified to be liaisons to tribes, uh, to rural communities, to public private partnerships, and also um, legislative and higher education coordination. We also have an implementation team that is structured around the various different funding categories. So we have a transportation lead, an energy lead, a broadband lead, um, and uh, focusing on different areas. And this is all available on our website. Uh, and I will drop a link to that in the chat here in just a few minutes. Uh, so you can see this, this organization chart. But if you're a community that is really interested in a water project in particular, you can go ahead and just reach right out to our water coordination lead um, and work with them to help uh, identify funding opportunities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, I mentioned this already, our coordination team. Uh, just a quick highlight. Those of you who are in rural Utah, Stephen Lizenby uh, is the governor's uh, senior advisor for rural uh, rural affairs. And so he's a great point person, person for you. Uh, if you're a tribal government, you can work with Dustin Jansen. And if you have a community that has a lot of federal land, a lot of BLM or Forest Service land or National Park Service nearby, um, coordinating with our public lands office um, may be a good resource for you as well. Next slide. So here are the two websites uh, that I mentioned that are great resources for you. On our GOPB website, we have all of that state contact info, information so you know who you can reach out to. We also have a grants database that you can sort by eligibility, due date, uh, see which grants are currently open. We update that almost daily. Um, so it always has a lot of good information on it. You can say, okay, what grants are 
um, are local governments eligible to apply for, and it will pull up a list there. In addition to that, the White House um, has produced a website called build.gov, uh, and they have a guidebook that goes through every single one of the funding programs within the IIJA and talks a little bit about its intent, eligibility, um, types of programs uh, that are eligible in, within there. They also have broken that down to create a rural playbook and a tribal playbook um, for communities uh, that fall into those categories and, and just want to go right to, okay, what, what is designed to help rural Utah or what is designed to help tribes um, and pull that information out as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is a, a, high, a snapshot of our, the tracking dashboard that's available on our website. We've been adding links to funding programs as they become available, um, as well as tracking when they are due. And so you can see whether uh, there is somebody within the state that is currently going after one of these programs or not. Um, and then there's a large database of other resources that you could search through as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as local governments, you're probably saying, well, how can I best access these funds? And so we put this little chart together with five key steps that you should be thinking about. The first of which is really to develop a list of priority projects. If you're a community, you probably have roadway projects, you have water projects, uh, you may have a sewer project that you need to take care of. Maybe there's um, <clears throat> you know, a variety of different things or an industry that you're trying to attract and, and grow within your, your market sector, within your community. Um, so the first step really is to develop a list of priority projects that you have needs for in your community. The second step would be to go to that grants database um, on our website, search through the various funding opportunities. It's a searchable Google sheet. So you can, you can search for a keyword. Um, you can search for a department that might be managing it or just a category um, and identify funding opportunities that might be applicable uh, to your particular need. The next step really would be to coordinate with relevant Relevant partners. We're really encouraging local governments to reach out and work closely with their AOGs um, to help. The AOGs should be able to assist you with some grant writing expertise um, and support. Uh, and we also encourage you to reach out to the relevant state agency. So if it's a roadway project, reach out to UDOT. If it's a water pro project, reach out to the Division of uh, of drinking water or uh, water quality or water resources, um, and they can be great partners for you as well. The fourth step really would be in, to evaluate your internal capacity. Do you have the ability to manage this grant? Can you meet all of the reporting requirements? If there's a matching requirement, as there is for some of these, do you have the match available? And then lastly, start to develop a competitive proposal. And a little bit more on that, uh, that topic is on the next slide, which I believe is my last. So ways that you can increase your competitiveness as you're going after these various different grants. Make sure that you really understand what the grant is asking for. A lot of times as you're reading um, the Notice of Funding Opportunity or NOFO, they have keywords that are built into it. And so read through that and, and highlight uh, what you think the grant is actually looking for. There's often th specific types of things that the federal government is looking for. This administration is really interested in clean energy. They're very much interested in breaking down um, historic inequities and solving, um, you know, helping disadvantaged communities. And so look for those keywords as you're looking through the grant uh, opportunity and make sure that you are developing a proposal that, that speaks to those. Uh, having broad community support is critical. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have good partnerships. So reach out to your state partners, reach out to your AOGs, work across city lines or community lines if you can uh, to put together joint applications. They're so much stronger if you can work together. Many of the requirements or the grants do require a local match. Not all of them do, um, but most of them do. So the more money that you can bring to the table, uh, the better. Um, I do not believe that it's, you're eligible to match, um, use ARPA dollars as a match. It, was, it would be federal to federal. Uh, but if you have some local dollars, that would be um, strongly encouraged. And then really make sure that you're, you're taking a good hard look at it and saying, you know, yes, it's, it's money, but is it really worth our time? Sometimes putting together the grant applications can be fairly time consuming. And so you need to determine 
if if the money that is potentially available, um, if it's going to be worth the effort to put that application together, and does your project really fit the parameters of the grant well? If it doesn't, you may put a lot of effort into putting a proposal together that isn't all that competitive. Um, and then lastly, make sure you've got really good data, you have a detailed argument, but you're comprehensive yet concise in your application. Um, and I think we'll have some time for questions and answers at questions and answers at the end of all of this. Um, but I think that's my last slide and I'll turn it back over to you, Taylor. Thanks, Laura, I appreciate oh, that. Can I, can I add one more thing? I'm so of sorry. Course. Yeah. Um, also, we, the uh, Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, just put together a newsletter um, for IIJA, and I'm going to put a link in the chat here on where you can subscribe to that newsletter. It comes out monthly. We'll be uh, listing all of the recently announced um, funding opportunities, as well as some good information that might be useful to you. So go ahead and subscribe. And now I'm done. Thank you, Taylor. Great. Thank you, Laura, for all that, that great uh, information and helpful information for local government. So I'm here to talk about ARPA funds, the state and local fiscal recovery funds. Um, I know I've talked to many of you on the phone or through email as I've helped coordinate uh, the state's distribution of these funds to local governments. Uh, so my goal here is just to be a resource, to be helpful to you, uh, to help answer maybe any remaining questions you have. Uh, you know, you've had the funds now, the first tranche of funds for a year. Uh, you've gone through one reporting cycle. Um, so some of you, you know, ho hopefully you have some experience in this, some awareness of the ARPA funds and, and responsibilities, the requirements. Um, but I'm here just to present a few of those uh, and, and to help you, you know, stay out of trouble, essentially. Um, so just as a reminder, with with the ARPA funds, our role as a state and GOPB, the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, is slightly different than it was uh, with the CARES Act funds that you received two years ago. Those funds you received from us, we were your, we distributed the funds to, to you um, and you reported to us uh, and we were responsible for monitoring you. It was uh, that subrecipient relationship that we had with you. With the ARPA funds, the Treasury and the federal government has made it clear you are direct recipients of the funds from the federal government and you report directly to them. Um, even though we might help distribute the funds, uh, you know, in the case of for smaller units of local government, uh, we have been the source in which you've received the funds. But the, the treasury still receive the treasury still views it as that you have received the funds from them. They awarded the funds to you, and we just helped uh, aided them in in the distribution of those. Uh, the one so so again, you are re, you know directly reportable to the the federal government, the U.S. Treasury. The one exception exception to this that can get kind of confusing uh, for some local governments is if you've been awarded a grant from the state using ARPA funds. For example, we had our local match program that we ran last fall. Um, there were 36 projects that got funded um, and 36 uh, grant awards. And those are using the state's ARPA funds uh, that we awarded to you. I know, you know, the governor's office of economic opportunity is also running some grant programs, you know, the, uh, Department of Environmental uh, Quality is also running some grant programs where they're providing grants to local governments. So in all of those cases, if you received the funds from a, through a, a competitive grant award, um, then in those cases, you report to the state and that agency that awarded you the funds uh, on the use of those funds. And so you have to kind of separate them out in your mind if, if this case does apply to you, uh, that there's the funds you were allocated and entitled to uh, from the federal government, and then there were the funds you, maybe that you were awarded from a state agency. Um, so just a quick update. <clears throat> As you're aware, hopefully everyone's aware that the second tranche of ARPA funds is now available. We have the funds. We've been distributing them to local governments. Uh, we have asked uh, each local government to respond to a survey that we sent out at the end of June. I've sent a couple of reminders since. Um, and in this uh, survey, you report your UEI or your unique entity identifier from SAM.gov, and you confirm your contact information because, uh, you know, since last year we collected uh, contact information in some cases, you know, clerks have left or the mayor has left and there's now a new mayor and an authorizing representative. So we need uh, confirmation in, of updated uh, contact information along with your UEI so far, we've had 185 local governments that have responded to the survey. 
uh, and we've distributed about 88 Point two million. Um, so we uh, we have ninety three million to distribute that's allocated to local governments. We still have forty five local governments that have not responded to this uh, to this survey. I'll be I know Liam uh, from the the league has been reaching out to you. Uh, I'll be doing that as well this week, trying to reach out to you uh, for those that haven't responded. We want to get these funds to you. Um, so moving on, I uh, just I wanted to cover. I know. Everyone should have had the opportunity. I know there's a few cases where someone, a few entities have not completed their report to the U.S. Treasury. Um, But I wanted to review the reporting um, and kind of talk about some best practices with how to report to the to the federal uh, U.S. Treasury, um, how to use their system, some kind of best practices. I know in some cases. Uh, local governments hadn't started using the funds yet uh, when their report was due in April. And so you you went through that reporting process, but you might've just put zeros on everything because you hadn't spent the funds. Um, so although everyone has completed a report, hopefully at this point, uh, not everyone has gone through the experience of you know entering in project information, expenditure information, and things like that. Um, so just as a quick overview, again, um, there are two types of reports. And uh, the, the main type is a project and expenditure report. Uh, it's due quarterly for the state, uh, for counties, and for metro cities if they have a population of more than 250,000 um, or 10 million in ARPA funds. If that's the case, these reports are due quarterly. If you are uh, what the Treasury has, has called an NAU, NEU, or a non entitlement unit of local government, and you received your ARPA funds through our office, um, then your report, your your expenditure and project report is due on an annual basis, and that would be the April 30th of each year. Um, and additionally, uh, additionally, there is a second type of report for states, counties, and metro cities of you know more than 250,000 in population, and that's an annual recovery plan and performance report. And this is a written report of the projects you're doing um, and and uh, information about each of those projects. Um, as well as your approach to how you're using the funds. So that's due annually for for larger entities. Um, Going into this a little bit more now. um, So as you, for for those entities that haven't begun, uh, hadn't begun spending funds when the report was due in April, uh, you know, this is a reminder that each expenditure that you make must fit under a project, an overall project that you have established. And that project must coordinate uh, and be labeled with uh, uh, Treasury's expenditure categories. And these are listed here. These are the, the seven major categories. Um, and then within there, within each of these categories, there's subcategories with numbers. So there might be a, a 1.19 or 1. Uh, you know, 1.29 or something like that, that coordinates with a specific expenditure category. So each project that you establish must fit within one of these categories. Um, and that's how you do your reporting is you report a project, you report uh, what the expenditure category is, and then you report expenditures under that project. And the treasury knows each of those expenditures is tagged with that uh, expenditure category. You know, for example, if you're using it for uh, drinking water to build a new, uh, a new drinking water tank, uh, that would be under category five the infrastructure. And there's a specific um, category uh, five point something I don't have in front of me here, but uh, that would be specific to drinking water. Um, and that's how you would categorize that. Um, if you go to the compliance and reporting guidance established by the treasury in appendix one, you'll find the, the complete list of all these categories, each of the sub subcategories within these expenditure categories. And as, so as you plan your, as you plan your projects, uh, make sure you know which one it fits under. Um, one of the, uh, I guess really quickly, the one to point out here that I wanted to go into more depth is category six. This is revenue replacement. And I know many of you have heard of it. I know there's still some circulating confusion about what that necessarily means. So I wanted to dive into this a little bit. Revenue replacement is, you know, it, an allowed category where you can use these funds to replace lost public sector revenue due to the pandemic. And the treasury has established that there's two methods of of declaring lost public sector revenue. The first method is you can follow their calculation that they provide in their final rule. Uh, They they provided an interim rule last year and then clarified it some and provided additional resources to understand it in the final rule uh, that was uh, made uh, final as of April 1st of this year. 
And that you, you follow that calculation spits out a, a number that you now establish as your lost public sector revenue for that fiscal year or that calendar year. Uh, the second way the Treasury has established is that they recognize that this can be burdensome. Um, and th th they decided after a lot of research uh, that they feel like any local government had the chance of losing between zero and $10 million. That was kind of the average that they found in their study, zero and $10 million of uh, lost revenue due to the pandemic. And so they created this standard allowance of $10 million that any local government, no matter their size, no matter if you received 10,000 in ARPA funds, you know, 500,000 or 20 million, um, anyone can uh, either do the formula or select the standard allowance of up to $10 million. And essentially that means they are not going to make you prove that your lost public sector revenue. You can accept up to $10 million. If your allocation is $250,000 and you select this option of their standard allowance, you can use your any amount of your allocation up to that $250,000 or up to $10 million if you have that uh, as lost public sector revenue. And then if you've categorized expenditures this way, you're essentially saying we're using this for government services. Um, and uh, some, something that the Treasury clarified in April of this year in this, their FAQ document 3.3, if you go and look in, and read at this, um, they make it clear that you can use, uh, you can designate uh, an expenditure, a project as revenue replacement, even if it qualifies under one of the other expenditure categories. So my example before of if, you know, if it's drinking water, you're building a new tank, it's eligible under the, you know, category, expenditure category five infrastructure. Uh, but the treasury makes it clear here, you are allowed to, even though it's eligible under that other category, you can still place it under the category of revenue replacement. And the reason for doing this is it eases the reporting burden. I know for many of you, um, you know, accepting these funds has been frustrating because of the reporting burden. Uh, you might only come in once a week or a couple times a week, or you might have limited staff. You might be the only full-time person uh, in your town or city. And, and so the treasury, I think, has tried to acknowledge that and tried to provide an opportunity for local governments to have um, a streamlined way of, of reporting. And when you report under a project under revenue replacement, you only report uh, a project name, a project description, uh, aggregate obligations for that project and aggregate expenditures. You don't have to provide expenditure details uh, of where the funds went and how much and what date and, and all of that. It's just together during that reporting period, how much did you obligate in contracts for that project and how much did you spend uh, for that project during that, that reporting period? Um, and so this, this is a great way of uh, easing some of the burdens that, that might be upon you. The, the treasury has, has provided this resource. And so, you know, when you go in and report um, it's, it's much easier um, and you don't have to, to report uh, it, it, extremely detailed information. Um, so going back to, you know, if, if you are not using revenue replacement or maybe you use some revenue replacement, but not all of, not all of your allocation is for revenue replacement. Um, if you are again, using the water tank example, um, building a, a drinking water tank, uh, and let's say it costs, you know, $2 million and you're using, you know, 500,000 of your ARPA allocation or so, um, you, for any expenditures that are over $50,000, uh, and you're not using the revenue replacement expenditure category, you're using the other normal expenditure categories, you need to provide to, to collect, to record, and then provide in your report uh, de detailed information about those expenditures over 50,000. So you'll have to provide vendor information, uh, their address, the TIN or the UEI, uh, the, the type of recipient, whether it was a contractor, a subrecipient or beneficiary, uh, then you also have to provide obligation information, the contract number, the award dates, the award amount, a description of the contract uh, of what's going on there. Um, and so, you know, this is you need to be aware of these requirements up front so that you're collecting this information as you're spending the funds. If, if you're an NEU that only has to report April 30th of each year. Uh, if you're not collecting this information now, and then in April, you know, you realize you have to, you have to have that, it's going to be a, a lot more work to try and go back six months, nine months, a year ago or so, uh, to try and collect that information from the vendors that you provided, uh, payments to for, with ARPA funds. 
Um, for any expenditures that were under 50,000, a contract that was under 50,000 or a grant or a direct payment that was under 50,000, um, these are reported in the aggregate. Um, you report during that, re that period of the report, you say, you know, I spent, um, it, it's still by project. So you have to say, you know, for my drinking water tank project, I spent, you know, maybe $76,000 uh, in aggregate in uh, contracts. Uh, but all of those contracts were less than 50,000 or direct payments um, under 50,000. So those are reported in aggregate. Um, really quickly, also, I wanted to bring up uh, import versus manual entry. Uh, the, the Treasury and all the guidance, they, they have tremendous amount of helpful guidance uh, available to, to us. But you have to remember that the guidance that they're providing is used by states who has, you know, we have over a billion dollars of, of funds. And also it's, it's also geared toward, uh, you know, an NAU that maybe has $50,000 uh, of ARPA funds. And so you have to kind of pick through and filter and understand what's applicable and, and what's helpful for you in, in your local government. Um, so for example, if you have only $50,000 in ARPA allocation, or maybe even 200,000 uh, in ARPA allocation, and you only have maybe two projects and all of your expenditures are less than 50,000, or you might have one or two that's over 50,000, it honestly is probably gonna be faster uh, and, and less confusing to just enter that information manually into the portal. Um, the, the Treasury talks about in their guidance that you should use their templates for uploading your information. However, their templates are there for if, if you have dozens and you know, uh, hundreds maybe of expenditures that you're reporting during that period, uh, that's burdensome to, to report in a manual way. And so they've provided templates that you enter the information there in a spreadsheet and then upload it to their, to their portal. Um, I, you know, if, if, if that takes more time than manually entering, uh, ig ignore their advice or, you know, their, their direction to use the, the template, uh, because that's there for, for extensive, uh, you know, entities that have lots of projects, lots of, um, transactions over 50,000, where you're entering lots of vendor information, you're entering lots of, um, you know, obligation information, the import function is great. Um, but if you're, if you have less, just use the manual, uh, manual entering the information manually in the portal, that'll probably be easier. Um, so really quickly before, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit, um, Hopefully that provided some kind of overall best practices of how to approach reporting. Um, and as you're establishing your projects over the next year uh, before your next report in April. Um, and so I want to quickly cover kind of compliance issues. And then we're, I'm going to turn it over to Holly and Andrew at the auditor's office. Uh, they're going to go into more depth into this and provide you with more understanding um, of the compliance issues that you need to be aware of. Uh, I'm just going to kind of broach the subject first and, and kind of introduce it here. Um, just, uh, I, I liked this quote here on the screen. Uh, this is from the compliance and reporting guidance from, from the treasury. And I know, you know, I, I'm res responsible for reporting on the state's expenditures, um, to the, the federal government. And I know the, the frustration that it can cause in having to track a lot of this information. And I know I've talked to many of you on the phone uh, where you've talked to me and said, you know, I'm only come in twice a week or, or, you know, whatever circumstance it may be, we've, we've talked together about how complicated this can be and frustrating it can be. Um, but, you know, this quote here of remembering that transparency and public accountability for these funds, the uh, state and local fiscal recovery funds, um, are, is criti critical for upholding program integrity and trust in all levels of government. So you have a special trust uh, being employed by your local government in, in making sure that people can trust your government. And, and so just keep this in mind as you, as you work through the frustrations of, of the reporting and the compliance. Remember that you you're, have a special trust of, of upholding um, you know, the, the, the trust that your, your citizens have in you and your government. Is, and so as you work for tracking this information, trying to be transparent and, um, it will help you as you, as you deal with the frustrations. So really quickly, some, some basics of compliance, right? So, um, the, the guiding, the kind of document that you have to go to, um, to understand eligibility is the final rule. Um, this was provided by the treasury. Um, it provides guidance for all uh, allowable uses 
of, uh, of these funds. Now I'll, I'll recommend there's an overview of the final rule. That's much shorter. I actually don't remember how many pages it is, but in comparison to the final rule, which is, uh, in close to a hundred or more pages, uh, and has lots of commentary, lots of detail, lots of information there to help work through some of the details or questions that you have. If you want to just get a, a good basic understanding, you, you have a quick question about something, uh, I recommend also l- reviewing the overview of the final rule provided on the Treasury's website. Uh, this gives you a clear um, kind of checklist understanding of, okay, under this category, here's the non-exhaustive list of eligible uses of, of the funds in this category. Um, and it, they provide some, some great detail there for you. Uh, next is the compliance and reporting guidance document provided by the Treasury. This goes over all the things that you need to be aware of for compliance and all the things that you need to be aware of for reporting. Um, in addition to the, the, so the reporting here in this document is, is discussing kind of the, the report in general, the approach, um, what's required in the report. Uh, but the mechanics of reporting is in a separate document. The Treasury has released several uh, guide documents on, on how to, the, the, the mechanics of reporting, as well as webinars that they have available for you. And then the other kind of basics to keep in mind is that you need to remember that all of your funds have to be obligated by December 31st of 2024. Uh, so obligated in contracts and, and such. Uh, and then the funds have to be completely spent uh, by December 31st of 2026. Um, the, the last thing here to kind of bring your attention to is that the federal government has a standard set of, uh, requirements for federal awards. So you re- have received this award of ARPA funds from the federal government and that these, the standard set of what they call uniform, uh, administrative requirements, uh, is applicable to you. And, you know, this, this is labeled as 2 CFR 200 is this, this federal rule uh, is the name of it. Um, and in here, it talks about having robust internal controls. It talks about having, you know, administrative, making sure that you are using administrative costs appropriately, making sure that you are monitoring any subrecipients. If you are contracting with uh, another entity to help carry out a program on your behalf, maybe you're, you're a county and, um, you have, um, you know, you've contracted someone to help you with a grant program or, um, something like that. You, you have to monitor those subrecipients. Um, uh, this also provides that there, there are procurement standards that you have to follow from the federal government. Um, so it's, it's vast, um, it, and maybe sometimes, uh, it, it overwhelms me sometimes in, in my responsibility of following these, um, but there's a lot of resources here. So specifically, you can go to the FAQ document from the Treasury. Uh, they have the whole section 13. So the questions 13.1 through 13.17 covers uh, questions and answers and information about these the compliance requirements associated with these the, the federal standard of of. Um, uniform requirements. And so I, my recommendation would be to go and look at those, um, you know, glance through the, the compliance and reporting document, look at the section about procurement uh, standards. You know, what does it say? Are, you know, do your own requirements in, in your government, do those follow the anyway? And you just need to follow your, your local uh, procurement standards, or is there an extra requirement from the federal government here? Um, you know, look at the, the final rule FAQ, um, look through, skim through that and, and see what's applicable uh, for your situation and you know, what you need to, to keep an eye out for. Um, so with that, uh, there's kind of the, the, the brief summary of kind of best practices of reporting as well as approaching re- compliance. Uh, the auditors now uh, will, Andrew and, and Holly will go into more detail. They are experts in, in understanding these and, and directing and, and knowing kind of maybe where the pitfalls are, things that you need to be aware of. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and turn uh, the, the time over to them. And then I, I guess, unless we want to do some question and answers before we move to that, I'm thinking... Maybe we just move on to compliance and then kind of take question and answers at the end. Is that all right, Rachel? Yeah. Okay. So Holly and Andrew. Yes, that's will... perfect. Okay. And, and just as a reminder to people, they can submit questions in the chat and then we'll answer them. The presenters will answer them uh, as they're able. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. And Holly and Andrew, we'll turn the time over to you and your expertise in, in the compliance best practices here. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, I'm going to get us started. Uh, with an emphasis on a concern that we have. Andrew's gonna share his screen for us. 
um, and we'll get those over to Rachel so they can be sent out. Uh, as there's many of you that we know, and we appreciate you attending uh, this luncheon meeting uh, to learn more about ARPA and infrastructure grants. Uh, we, our goal is to promote good governance at all levels in the state of Utah. That's from the smallest irrigation district all the way up to the state of Utah itself. And while we call ourselves the watchdog and sometimes that has a gotcha attitude, we really wanna provide that independent assessment in this case for ARPA and in future years for the infrastructure grants that are gonna be coming through. Uh, Taylor touched on this very briefly, um, but I wanna remind you about a key part of any federal dollar now before the pandemic, we could say there's no such thing as free money. Um, the coronavirus relief fund and, and some of the way ARPA money works um, kind of stretches that, but the infrastructure um, grants are getting us back to some of these um, somewhat potentially burdensome requirements to have and receive federal dollars. And one key piece, Taylor mentioned reporting the back-end reporting for ARPA, the back-end reporting for Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, and then Laura mentioned even that pre-award effort and burden of creating a competitive um, project. We have one extra layer that we will always audit. It's part of doing an audit for federal compliance and it relates to your internal controls. And, and we really try to emphasize that for you as a city, as a town, as a county, as a special service district, you must, and this is this is federal wording, not state auditor wording that, that we would um, put out there, but this is federal wording. You as a non-federal entity, including the state of Utah, must establish and maintain effective internal controls. And those internal controls must provide reasonable not absolute assurance, but reasonable assurance that you are managing the program in compliance with federal statutes, regulations, and terms and conditions of the federal award. And that's something to keep in mind as you go through these grants, I'm sure with the new money that you've had from pandemic programs, you've started to recognize that there is a burden to receiving that money, to reporting how you spend that money. And then you have this layer that Taylor mentioned. You must have and maintain effective internal control to ensure compliance with those requirements, whether it's in your federal award letter, whether it's coming from an award letter from the governor's office of planning and budget. Those are still federal dollars you still need to have internal controls. And that's where we see a lot of struggles, especially for an organization that has not previously dealt with a lot of federal dollars. Those internal controls aren't really understood. You're given all sorts of money really fast to spend rather quickly. And you, you really don't have those internal controls. So whether it's us as your auditor, for example, with GOPB, or it's your CPA firm, that is performing the federal compliance audit. We are all looking at your internal controls and, and, and the separation of duties when it comes to ensuring compliance with those awards. That's a general application for any federal dollar you receive either directly from the feds or through the state of Utah. And now Andrew's gonna talk some more specifics with ARPA. Thanks Holly. And I'll ask you to pardon my cough up front when we talk about long-term effects. Um, unfortunately, ARPA can't fund anything to help me deal with my COVID cough. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, so we've covered a lot in terms of compliance. Taylor's done a fantastic job going over ARPA funding. And um, there's just a couple of things I would highlight uh, best practices from an audit perspective. <laughs> um, as you're developing your projects, as you are executing your projects, um, that you're you're using to spend these these funds, um, the treasury has given specific guidance on how you connect these projects to coronavirus response, and you can see here from the purpose, the key four purposes of of these funds, 
you're to respond to the coronavirus. <coughs> its effects, either short or long term, and and as we talked about earlier, the CARES money that you receive prior is very different from these funds. Um, these ARPA funds have a lot more latitude, and you saw that probably with the interim rule during fiscal 21. Um, with 22, they've issued the final rule, which is 117 pages of fun-filled facts about how to spend and not spend this money. Um, but th there's some real key guidance in there that you really need to connect response. You need to identify a response or, or a need, a harm, an effect of the virus, and connect it to an, an appropriate response to address that harm or impact. And <coughs> not only identify it and connect them together, but document it. From an audit perspective, that is probably one of the most important things you can do in your decision-making process is document it. Um, that's one of the best ways to help an auditor move through and um, determine compliance or non-compliance is considering that documentation. Um, those responses, especially if you are working with um, grants that uh, distribute funds to households, um, businesses, or other uh, members of the community, um, those responses need to be proportionate to the harm that's been caused. So that's, that's a key element to consider. <coughs> you also need to focus um, on the impacted and disproportionately impacted uh, members of the community. Those are really important elements of your determination. They need to be included in your documentation. And um, that's, that's, like I say, another way to help the auditor move through and determine compliance. Um, the, the key thing I would point out here is you have a lot of latitude. Um, Taylor put up all those categories. There's a lot of latitude for what you can spend this money on. Um, and the, the key thing from, from the treasury is that with so many pressing and effective ways to use these funds, there isn't an excuse for any waste, fraud, or abuse. So make some, make some good documented decisions on how you're gonna use these funds in effective ways um, under your stewardship. So just a couple of things um, to kind of highlight. I, again, um, documentation to support your expenditures. That's the most important thing you can do. Um, Taylor had mentioned the determination for the $10 million standard allowance um, rather than doing um, a lost revenue calculation. Documentation should be requested by your auditors to help um, support your determination for your eligibility for that standard allowance or your lost revenue calculation. So although it, it seems like a pretty easy hoop to jump through, you need to be documenting some things. Um, one key thing with that standard allowance is watch for um, the tax revenue versus governmental service revenue. Um, those are two very different types of revenues that your, gen your, your government may generate. So be very cautious about what you're considering there because tax rev reductions of net tax revenue are not necessarily 100% eligible for um, funding under ARPA. So keep that consideration in mind. Um, a lot of you may be receiving these funds and you may be passing them directly on to what Treasury calls end beneficiaries. So right to the person who is in need or family or household or, or entity. Um, some of you may make arrangements or agreements with other entities to help you carry out your program. Um, these sometimes can be called subrecipients, and we could spend uh, an inordinate amount of time talking about the difference here. Um, one general rule of thumb to keep in mind is if you pass on your decision-making power with these funds, to another entity, you have most likely created what's called a subrecipient relationship. And that triggers those monitoring requirements that Taylor talked about. So keep that in mind because that's an, another layer of compliance that you may be then held accountable for. So watch for that. If you have questions on that, um, the state of Utah deals with that. My office deals with that all the time. The uh, state agencies deal with it all the time. GOPB has been learning how to deal with it. Um, come and ask questions. We are a resource available to help you figure out what to do in those cases. Um, <clears throat> the other elements to talk about really are just whether or not you're gonna go through an audit or an examination. Um, there are very different requirements for your auditors when they're doing that. So luckily for those of you who qualify for the examination, you may need to make that determination. 
but you have less hoops to jump through, um, luckily, but it can be challenging. So as you're doing that, feel free to reach out with questions or, or concerns, comments, as well as your CIFA reporting. Um, if you are new to this world, you may realize that you have another layer of financial reporting to include your financial statements with your CIFA um, to actually report these um, expenditures of federal awards. So keep that in mind. Um, Taylor already hit on a lot of the guidance that's available to you. And he's provided you a lot of really fantastic links, more than I even knew, which is great. So I'll be talking to him later. Um, but two things that I would point out to you in order to help guide whether or not you feel like you're in compliance or not, the first thing to look at is your executed assistance agreement with Treasury. There should be a warm award terms and conditions in that agreement. If you're unaware of that, then you might need to dig a little bit. So, so keep an eye on that. The other thing is just to look at Treasury's final rule. It is really, um, from the guidance we've been given, it is really what Treasury is going to hold you accountable to. So uh, your expenditures need to match what's in the final rule. If you expended funds in the, um, under the interim rule, um, they can still be grandfathered in under the final rule. Um, you can also look at those FAQs. Again, pages and pages and pages of fun-filled facts of how you can spend and not spend this money. So I provided you a couple of links here as well, as well as some contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to us at any time with any questions you have for the audit. I believe with that, I'll turn it back to Taylor or Laura or Rachel. Yeah, I, I, we can go back to Rachel. I, I think now's uh, questions and answers. I think we've been trying to do it through uh, response through chat. I don't know if there's any additional ones before. Yeah, but, so this yeah. is your chance, everybody. If you want to throw a couple of questions into the chat, you have uh, a resource here. So um, we'll just wait you know, one or one more minute to see if anything shows up in the chat. Uh, and I'll let you, Taylor and, and Laura, kind of handle those questions. Um, while we wait to see if there are any additional questions, let me just say uh, thank you so much to Sophia and Laura and Taylor and Holly and Andrew. Uh, we at the League uh, greatly appreciate and value our relationship with uh, our state uh, partners and all the work that you're doing to assist in in these areas amongst others. So thank you for being here and being available. Um, the presentations will be made available to you. We will have them, we'll put them on the website and uh, provide the access to you. As I mentioned before, a recording of this presentation will also be on our website. So if you know, if there are people within your communities that uh, wanted to participate today or have questions, that will be available on the league's website as well. Um, Let's see here. There. So the question was, can you forward this presentation to us? Yes. So we will make sure that that is, um, that is available. And there's another question in here. I don't know if our panelists can see the question. Um, and I'll just let you take it from there, uh, address that question, Laura. This one looks like a, a Taylor question. A Taylor question. Oh, I, I think it looks like an auditor question. They're asking about, um, you know, if, if an audit is performed on these dollars, anyway, do you? Yeah, we can, we can go ahead and answer that. The, if you haven't read it in the Q and a, um, it's the question is from Chris Harding. Is there anything that requires local governments example, given Salt Lake County to have an audit performed of these dollars? Does that fall to the County auditor or the auditor of the financial statements? Like for example, Squire and company, uh, federal rules require a, say we call it a single audit. There's lots of reasons behind why it's called a single audit. But if you are a governmental entity or even a nonprofit entity that is receiving $750,000 or more of federal assistance, it is not federal assistance for one program. It's in total, your federal assistance is greater than $750,000. You're required to have a single audit or a federal compliance audit. It is in conjunction with your financial statement audit. Um, so if you have Squire and Company in this example that is auditing your financial statements, they would also do the audit of the federal compliance or single audit. They would issue a report on compliance as well as a report on your schedule of expenditures by federal award. 
And that would be in conjunction with the financial statement audit. You cannot have a single audit without having the financial statement audit also completed. I hope that answers that question. It looks like there's another one in the in the yeah, yeah, I can answer I can answer this one. So uh, Carl asked, when does the timeline open for the second reporting? Is it open now or start of calendar year? So the the reporting, um, if if you're in NEU and you report annually, um, the reporting is for any expenditures uh, that would be from, for example, this this next reporting cycle would be any expenditures from April 1st of 2022 through March 30th of 2023. And then as soon as that ends, so you're supposed to report on any expenditures made during that time period. So they don't open the report until April 1st of 2023. Uh, and then you have 30 days to complete that report um, for reporting on those expenditures over the last year. Um, if you're an entity that does quarterly uh, reporting, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the report opens the, the first day after the end of the quarter. Um, and then you have 30 days to complete that. So hopefully that helps answer that question. And uh, there's another question about the audit. Yeah, Amy, Amy maybe asked. It is, um, to clarify, it is $750,000 in expenditures per year. Uh, your financial audit is typically a 12 month period. Your single audit would be that same 12 month period. If you have $750,000 or more expended during that fiscal year, it, that will be the trigger for your single audit. But it is per year, not per life of the award. And I just want to point out um, in the chat, you will see two links by uh, Liam, and they are... Uh, resources that are being provided through the National League of Cities to assist in the infrastructure uh, bill as you utilize that. So please take a look at that. Just a reminder to League members that Liam is our ARPA resource. So you can call him anytime and ask whatever questions you wanna ask about ARPA. And uh, he can also assist with infrastructure questions. And uh, again, we'll provide these presentations, including a video uh, or recording of today's uh, Lunch with the Lead on our website. So those will be available to you. Uh, thank you again, uh, Sophia, Laura, Taylor, Andrew, and Holly. You were terrific presenters and it was such a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, as a plug for our next Lunch with the Lead, it's on September 6th. It's on Your Land, Your Plan, which is uh, an incredible opportunity uh, that will be provided to assist cities in maximizing public assets they already have through a grant through IHC in partnership with Zions Bank, so that we hope you'll be able to join us on September 6th. Before we wrap up, I'm just double checking to see if we have any other questions in the chat. Uh, I don't see any unless there's one that I've missed, but um, Sophia, is there anything else you want to add at the conclusion of our webinar? Uh, no, just want to, again, appreciate everyone for, for joining and, and encourage everyone to reach out. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you in future Lunch with the League. And thank you to our UAC members for joining with us today.